a, a lot of investors go in talking about exit and, and that's perfectly understandable. They want to understand how they're going to turn, you know, this investment back into money at the end. Um, we have the complete opposite view, which is that the really difficult thing in venture capital and in startups is building a great business. So for us, it's selecting, finding, selecting and investing and then helping build a really great business. It's not selling that great business at the end. And if you look at our, you know, all our successful companies, Canva, Safety Culture, Culture Amp, they're all now at a point where they're virtually liquid in that people are sending us emails out of the blue saying, hey, would you sell us some of your X company shares? And the difficult thing is not selling. Once you've got a great company, it's building the great company. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 150 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host, Rohit Bhargava, and each week I interview successful founders, investors, and subject matter experts on how they got started, strategies they you succeed, and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. For this milestone episode, I wanted to go big, and I am delighted to have the co-founder and partner at Blackbird Ventures, Rick Baker, as my guest for this episode. Blackbird is one off, if not the biggest venture capital fund in Australia. Since launching in 2012, Blackbird has gone on to raise four funds with a combined capital allocation of $1.24 billion. Their portfolio includes some of Australia's most iconic startups, including companies such as Culture App, Safety Culture, and Canva, of which they have a 14% ownership stake, by far the largest of any external investor. The success of their first fund led to them deciding to sell. 40% of Fund One for $100 million, providing a guaranteed 3x return for all of their LPs. In this interview, we covered a wide range of topics, including the story behind Blackbird's first fund, why Blackbird has a unique rule in only backing founders that aren't seeking exits, how Blackbird's internal culture and curiosity led to them investing in areas such as the future of food, space, and autonomous vehicles, the thinking behind Blackbird's decision to sell 40% of Fund One for $100 million, when and how to reach out to Blackbird for investment, and much more. Without further ado, here is my interview with Rick Baker. Hi, Rick. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today for the 150th episode of the podcast. It's, it's fantastic to be here. Great round number. Congratulations on getting to 150. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise, um, you know, I, I think Blackbird's has got an incredible story and uh, yeah, really appreciate you taking the time to, to come on the show and, and share some of your background and, and experience with Blackbird as well. But Rick, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Yeah, happy to do that. So uh, yeah, I'm one of the partners of Blackbird Ventures and uh, we are a venture firm here in Australia. I would say we're a fairly classic venture firm in sort of the Silicon Valley style of investing. We love investing super early. Uh, in fact, so early that often the idea, the, the products are just ideas in, in people's minds. The teams haven't been formed. The products haven't been built. Uh, we love that stage of investing. And then our mission really is to be able to back the founders all the way through their life cycle, particularly at the moment in the private markets. And so that means being able to invest in their rounds as they go along. A little bit about me. Uh, I grew up here in, in Sydney, went to university here, did a commerce and law degree. Didn't know what I wanted to do after finishing university, as I think is, is often the case. Uh, knew I didn't want to be a lawyer, that was for sure. And so I skedaddled over to London and ended up working for a, a little investment bank there that did M&A in the power sector. So I was an Excel junkie and I literally wrote models where you put gas in one side of the model, you got an IRR out the other side. Loved that, did that for a few years. And then in 2000, as many people were doing, got uh, excited by the dot-com boom and co-founded a, um, a software company with my cousin and a bunch of other people. They were in New York, us in London, and it did software for real estate agents. So it was a software that sat on a real estate agent's desk and managed their listings, their clients, and their reporting and their, their appointments, um, pretty much end-to-end -end everything. And it was really at a time when people were going from green, spring, green screens to, to browsers for the first time. Did that for five years. It was just a wonderful experience. We made so many mistakes. Uh, we, 
we managed to sell you know vaporware and then we had to quickly uh race to actually build the software uh it was a it was a real roller coaster and a wonderful learning experience uh came back to australia and uh, started a second business that business was called right party connect and that was in automated telephony so we we helped banks solve fraud on credit cards and collect collect debts ended up uh, selling that company to a uk company at that time i didn't know what i wanted to do after that uh, i liked the idea of venture capital i didn't really know that much about what it was and that got lucky i i managed to get a role at mlc in their private equity team and really spent 6 years there learning how to invest that was a wonderful experience had a really great investment committee that let us invest into new things ended up running the venture program ended up living in silicon valley for a while uh really enjoyed that that really gave me the urge to start a venture capital fund here in australia and was lucky enough to meet nikki and uh that was the beginning of blackbird Yeah and obviously it's been a been a fascinating fascinating story with Blackbird you know especially over the last few years as well. I think I read a stat recently that there are now over 100 VC funds in in Australia. I'm not sure if that number is how accurate that that number is but obviously it's been kind of fascinating to see how you know everything's kind of evolved over time but obviously when you and Nikki first started you know putting the pieces for for Blackbird together the landscape looked very different back then and i think that I, in the lead up to this interview i got to chat with Nikki who um told me a little bit about the story about how you two first got connected which was from a company in the first cohort of startmate called Gravel is that yeah, right that's right yeah exactly i was yeah. at Silicon Valley i was in um 500 startups office and the the Gravel founders were there, and uh, I think you know I was an Aussie, and they were like, "Hey, we've got some Aussies in the in the room," and they were those two, and those two then put me in touch with Nikki, and I learned um, what Nikki was doing at Startmate here in Australia, which was you know, one, you know, is still is I found we're totally biased here, but Nikki is is the best uh, accelerator in Australia, but back then was really pioneering, uh, doing accelerating accelerator program in in Australia. Got to know Nikki. I think uh he was quite keen that uh that when you know when I was at MLC that I might fund the idea of a of a venture fund that that he might start but at the same time I was thinking about the what next and decided to leave MLC and try and start a venture fund here as well and so when Nikki heard that he called me up and said let's have a coffee it was in a little cafe in Darlinghurst I remember it well and uh we got together and ended up chatting for ages and at the end of it sort of Nikki sent me an email saying hey how about how about we team up how about we try and do this together and it was a really serendipitous um coming together really i mean in in hindsight we didn't know each other that well when we started blackbird and it's uh it's been a wonderful kind of business relationship over the years i think we work really well together it's, it's been really awesome Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I mean obviously the founders of any business are kind of critically important and and a lot of that a lot of the success of business goes into the the relationship between the co-founders as well. What was that sort of initial meeting like between you and Nikki and I guess what did you sort of discuss and I guess what gave you both conviction to that you wanted to start Blackbird together? I think the key things were this real sort of confidence that Australia could produce a a cohort of really great startup companies technology startup companies at that time we were mainly thinking software I was about to say software companies it's a lot more than that now but back then it, it we were um thinking mainly software and mainly saas and i think we both bonded over this sort of idea this kind of paradox in the market that there were these great companies and there were about 10 at that time led by Atlassian but companies like Campaign Monitor and Aconex and Redbubble and Halfbrick Studios and a few others that were doing really really well and we were just couldn't believe that there was no great venture venture capital investors in Australia and that the US venture firms had just come and basically grabbed the cream of the crop crop invested in it and made a lot of money from doing so and we saw this sort of wide open opportunity in the market to to build a brand and and try and do something and it was at a time when there was almost no venture in the Australian system was pretty much shot to pieces there were a, a small handful of venture firms unfortunately they had struggled to raise their next funds 
And so they were all down to their, you know, maybe last one or two investments. The super funds had turned off the tap to Aussie Venture. Nikki and I went up to when we had decided to, to, uh, to raise our fund and we're just about to launch it, the AVCAL, which is now called AIC, which is the industry body for venture and private equity, invited Nikki and me along to a um, to the annual conference to kind of launch it, to be almost a sort of, you know, we've got to have a bit of venture capital here. Here are two guys doing something interesting. And the panel, uh, a couple of panels before us was a bunch of the, the super fund investors on the stage and someone threw in the question, what about Aussie VC? And they all agreed 100%. There was no room in any, any institutional portfolio for Aussie VC. It would never work. It wouldn't be a thing. And uh, there were Nikki and I getting up uh, an hour later saying, hey, we're raising this new Aussie venture fund. So it really was a time when there wasn't much, it was really contrarian. There wasn't much interest at all in, in doing this. And again, I think that was a big bonding moment for, for Nikki and me to, to bond around. It was almost this sort of like, we're going to go on this fight together to, to do what we passionately believe in and, and then sort of set out to do it, which is a whole nother story. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was, I don't know how public this information was, but I, I know that I was certainly surprised when I heard this, but to my understanding, um, you and Nikki didn't pay yourself from the first fund or, or didn't collect. No, uh, well, we, we, um, we started uh, Blackbird and we had a, a year of fundraising and we didn't pay ourselves that first year. And then we, our first fund is very small. That's $29 million. And so we weren't getting very much management fee at all. So we finally got to the stage, I think about six months in where we could pay ourselves a, a small salary. So six months after we raised the fund, so about 18 months in, we, uh, we started paying ourselves. So it was definitely a labor of love. Absolutely. And, you know, again, one of the things that you mentioned at the start, which I think for a lot of founders, they might have this potentially misconception about Blackbird when you mentioned that, uh, you know, Blackbird likes investing at the very early stages of, of a company uh, as well. I think a great example is Baraha. So Fed and Sibi and obviously the incredible work that, that they did. I had Fed on the podcast recently and he kind of spoke about how he sort of elbowed his way to the front uh, of an event to uh, to go and introduce himself to you and um, managed to find a way to to connect with all the other partners at the fund as well. But I guess from, from your perspective, what, what was it about sort of Fed and Sibi or, or what is it about founders that you sort of really look for in those early stages when, you know, you don't have a huge amount of data point around you to, to help provide that, that additional conviction for you? Yeah, it's, it's so much about the founders. It's very hard for me to give you a simple answer to this. There's no kind of cookie cutter set of criteria that we look for. It's really like this pattern, that complex pattern matching thing. I think confidence is such an important part of it. We want to see people who, can, who have a really big ambition and have the confidence to step up and say they're going to do that ambition. But then that ambition is kind of rooted in, real, in realism and in, in foundational thinking, in insights, in expertise, in knowledge of a demographic. There are so many different ways that people can show this spark of brilliance that we're looking for. And it's quite obvious when you see it, but it's really hard to describe. Uh, so with Fed and Sibi, I think firstly, the area we were really interested in, we just made an investment, you know, probably about 12 months, maybe two years ago in, in Zooks. And Zooks is a driverless car team. Uh, and we knew that the key sort of sensor for a driverless car was LiDAR. And we knew all about the, 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 the problems with current LiDAR. And we were really looking for picks and shovels into this industry. So when we heard about two people who were going to build a brand new lighter, you know, when they, when Fed came up to me at that, at that a, a event and told me about it, it was definitely something we wanted to, to dig into. We spent a few months with Fed and Sibi trying to just tease out their ambition and really understand what they wanted to do. And, and actually it was, a, I think, a wonderful sort of transformation for both of us and for the relationship between us as we went through sort of actually building out their ambition and, and really getting to the bottom of it and understanding what it was and understanding the way they wanted to build the LiDAR and the way they wanted to sell the LiDAR. And particularly that was about getting out to customers early. And we'd been, we've been evangelizing about this on the software side for years. Like you've got to get your product out. You've got to get it in the hands of users until it's in the hands of users. You don't really know how users will use it. Asking them is one thing, it's a little bit like watching 
watching a lion sort of in a cage being fed at a zoo versus watching a lion in, you know, out in the African hinterland chasing down a, a, a deer. They're very different styles of, of, of activity. And so we wanted Fed and Sibi to get out to the market quickly. I think their original thinking was that they would take a long time. They'd go and talk to these tier one manufacturers and then they would talk to the vehicle manufacturers and there'd be this sort of multi-year thing before they actually sort of got, got to talk and interact with customers. And so what we did with them was design this way to go and talk to the, um, the driverless car teams really early. And we were lucky enough to have a bunch of networks there and got them in. We designed with them this prototype program where the driverless cars would actually pay to be on this program to get the first prototype of the LiDAR. And again, that was all proof on our side that the, they were building something that the, that the driverless car teams really, really wanted. So going through that process with Fed and Sibby was, was really great. And that was, again, sort of, I guess, how we cemented the, the relationship. And by that stage, it was really clear that these were the sorts of people we wanted to invest in. It's, it's really interesting. You know, obviously, a lot, everyone kind of talks about the value add that they can provide after the, the sort of cash comes in or value add that they provide to their portfolio companies. But to my understanding, a lot of the introductions that you gave to Fed and Sibby were pre-investment into into the company and again through my conversations with them they mentioned that a lot of them went on to become uh you know key clients of theirs and uh i think it's it's craig barrett who's now one was also one of the introductions who's now their chair as well so it's yeah just interesting to see how how all the dots sort of connected yeah yeah look it's wonderful i would love to say that you know we we pioneered something there but i think every vc firm tries to make good introductions sort of around that um you know pre-investment and around it i would say that you know i think we have been really fortunate to build this great network around Blackbird. And one of the things that Nikki and I came up with when we first started was that we wanted this idea of founders helping founders and community uh, to be an essential part of Blackbird. We wanted it to be more than just a, a financial fund. We wanted it to be almost a, a feeling of belonging or, or a club-like feeling. And, and I know Nikki had, had you know, managed to get that happening at Startmate through the mentor group. And we really wanted to carry that through into Blackbird. So our first fund, although it was a really hard fundraise, we have this awesome group of close to 100 investors and most of them are tech founders. And, you know, Craig Barrett was, was one of them, right? And that's how we first got in touch with him was through, through finding, you know, we were out looking for Aussies that have done amazing things sort of in the tech space over in the US and he was on our list and so we got to know him. So, you know, building this this community around Blackbird, it's now swelled to be this quite big thing. And we now have a, a, a team which is called Founder Success, but is all about trying to help founders through connecting and activating our now quite big community. And I think that's a very special thing about Blackbird that, that came from very early on. Absolutely. One other thing that I want to pick up on that you mentioned a little bit earlier was helping shape the ambition for, for Fed and City specifically. Yeah. And, you know, again, a, a really interesting story that uh, both Fed and City told me was when they first pitched to you and uh, Nikki, they had gone through and done their research and going through the website in terms of specifically what you looked for, but they had overlooked uh, one important slide, which was the no exits slide and they and they presented an exit slide and the story that they told me was that you and Nikki both got up and kind of yelled to them and said never <laughs> never show us that slide go away and think about you know the type of company that you want to build uh, again like you know I, I think that's it's a really sort of fascinating approach and probably contrarian approach to what you know again from a founder perspective what a lot of founders would assume that investors want to hear as well can you share why having that sort of no exits philosophy is so important to to the way that you sort of look at look at founders that, that you're backing through your portfolio yeah, so a, a lot of investors go in talking about exit and, and that's perfectly understandable. They want to understand how they're going to turn, you know, this investment back into money at the end. Um, we have the complete opposite view, which is that the really difficult thing in venture capital and in startups is building a great business. So for us, it's selecting, finding, selecting and investing and then helping build a really great business. It's not selling that great business at the end. And if you look at our, you know, all our successful companies, Canva, Safety Culture, Culture Amp, they're all now at a point where they're virtually liquid in that people are sending us emails out of the blue saying, hey, would you sell us some of your X company shares? And the difficult thing is not selling. Once you've got a great company, it's building the great company. Also, 
it comes back to ambition. If we, we are looking for founders with really big ambition, and we think this ambition and the passion that comes with that ambition is a really important success point. And if you have a founder who's saying to you, while they're pitching to you, I want to sell to Google in two years, or you know, even I want to list next year. And listing's a different thing because it's not actually ex exiting, but they want to like get out of the business or you know, that's a bad signal to us because we're looking for people who are doing their life's work who never want to exit their businesses. And if a founder sells their company when it's worth 30 mil, 50 mil, 100 mil, that's the surest way that it's never going to be worth a billion dollars is to sell out too early. This is particularly, I think, a mindset thing in Australia where a lot of the early stage angel investors came in with this view of, hey, I've got to work out how I exit before I get in. And also where founders were thinking that 30 mil, 60 mil, 100 mil was just so much money that, you know, of course you would sell at that stage. And I think actually one of the wonderful things that, that you know, Atlassian and now Canva and, and hopefully a few others along the way are showing is that you can build these big multi-billion dollar companies and that's what we want people to be striving for. Um, it's an interesting uh, concept to tell our investors. Uh, we have 10-year funds right now. Investors do want to know how they're going to get their money back. Uh, and so when we say, when they ask us, you know, what's your exit strategy? We say we, we, our exit strategy is no exits. We, we smile and we, we explain what I've just said. But I think that also is starting to ring some, some bells with, with those investors as well, which is great. So I think we're getting to a stage now in Australia where that hopefully is that that ambition and that passion is starting to be understood and is starting to pay off to such a point that others will replicate it and, and continue and, you know, and, and build big companies off the back of it. Yeah. And I like, I mean, personally, I'd just be really curious to, to know whether, you know, over the last few years, whether you've seen a shift in the founders that are pitching to you, do you find that you have to kind of help I guess, lift their ambition as much as you did before? Is, is it about the same? Or, or like, I guess, has there been any change at all that you've noticed over the last few years and the founders that, that come to Blackbird? So I think there is a, there's a spectrum of founder ambition. And I think that spectrum has all, always been about the same. There have always been a very small number of Aussies who have been able to articulate their vision well, really well. Uh, and I'd say that has not really changed. I think the great thing is we're starting to see more of more Australians who are who are doing that and, and able to articulate that ambition and the foundational sort of insights that drive that ambition. But it's kind of the same. And then we're still seeing a long tail of much lower ambition, localized in Australia, sort of uh, replicating other ideas rather than real, real true innovative thinking. Uh, there's still a lot of that as well. So I don't think the spectrum has changed that much, but I'm really happy to see that there's more and more people who have these great big ambitions, which is just awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously we've spoken about you not wanting to, you know, not wanting your founders to think about exits, but obviously, as you mentioned, you know, the, the life cycle of funds in general are, are roughly 10 years or so. And I think it was quite recently that, you know, Blackbird made the decision to sell, I think it was 40% of fund one for a hundred mil. Yep. Yeah, I guess, you know, internally, what does that sort of decision making process look like for you? Obviously, you know, a lot of your fund one are just absolutely incredible companies as well. But, you know, how do you sort of balance that kind of long term, long term view with, you know, what the potential value of fund one could be versus, you know, having to provide that that return to your to your LPs as well? Yeah. So look, uh, our mission at Blackbird is to to invest through the really long term. And so we got to this position with Fund One where it had done really well. It was sitting on a multiple of 12 times at that time and it was all unrealized pretty much. It's tiny bit realized, but basically all unrealized. And look, our, our mission on a fund basis is, is not just to hold to the bitter end, but to make intelligent decisions on a portfolio basis to produce a really great return for our investors. With that fund one, we got to the stage where we could sell 40% of the, of the fund, return three and a half times the whole fund in cash to our investors. And that would set that fund up such that it could never be a bad fund. Three and a half times is a really good solid 
great like venture capital return over a full 10 year period. And we had the opportunity to do that at that stage and still have 60% of the money in the ground in these great companies to continue growing. And we thought that was a really good risk return trade-off at that stage of the, um, of the life of the fund and, and, and the companies. The other thing about that transaction is that it was a, something called a GP-led secondary, also called a slice transaction, where you sell a slice of the portfolio. But the great thing about it is that we don't just sell that slice of the portfolio off to other investors. What we do at Blackbird is we actually go and raise a new fund from the private market secondary world, which is now a, quite a well-developed asset class. We raise and build, create this new Blackbird fund, and then we sell from, from the, the 2012 to the, to the Blackbird fund. Now it's priced at arm's length because the new investors coming in actually, their job is, their key job is to set the price that we will do that. So it's a totally arm's length transaction. But then Blackbird gets to continue the ownership of, of those great assets and those great companies. And so we're not saying to the founders, hey, we're selling down, you know, we love you so much, we're selling 40% of our holding. What we say to them is what, what we're doing here is creating liquidity for this first group of investors, but within Blackbird, we're now continuing this ownership. This is just a transfer from one Blackbird vehicle to another. And we're able to continue our journey of supporting that company, you know, hopefully for a, for a longer period because that, that fund obviously, you know, then gets to run its life as well. Uh, so we think it's a really good way to, for us to extend our ownership and also to manage the portfolio in a way that creates great, great outcomes for our investors. Uh, it's a fairly new phenomenon. There'd been a few of them done around the world when we did it. And, you know, it's becoming more and more common now. And I think, I think it will continue to be pretty common. Yeah, re really, really fascinating. And obviously from, you know, speaking about it from a, I guess, from a founder perspective as well, when, you know, I assume when you've got companies in your portfolio, like Culture Amp and Safety Culture, that I assume would get sort of big acquisition offers. You know, again, from a, from the point of view of listeners of the show who are thinking about what does that sort of look like and how do you sort of maintain that ambition when you've got these sort of big numbers being thrown your way that are potentially life changing amounts of money for, for them and their families. What are, I guess, what are mechanisms or what are things that founders can do to help de-risk that or kind of help remove some of the things that help them kind of focus on, on the bigger picture and, and the bigger ambition? Yeah. So, so firstly, I think that's you know, the way you've articulated that is a really good reason why we are trying to test in the early stages before making our investment for the types of founders that are not just in it for hey, I want to create this much wealth and then I'm going to run off, you know, to the beach and whatever and, and, and you know, good on them and have a great life. But that's not the sort of founder we're looking for. So firstly, it's filtering, filtering for those founders who, who don't want to do that. But absolutely, you get to a stage where a founder has this quite large paper wealth or often, you know, still living, paying themselves small salaries and, you know, living in, you know, in, in, in a way that, you know, that, that, that doesn't equal to that, that, that wealth or even part of that wealth. And of course, that's where secondaries come in. And we are, you know, absolutely supportive of founders selling down pieces of, of their holding during the journey. You know, in the beginning, it's, it's usually a little bit that just sort of changes their, their kind of ability to, to uh, settle their family, you know, buy a house, you know, pay off that probably big mortgage, et cetera. Uh, and just gets them to a point where they can be more comfortable and really focus on the business. So that's the first sort of stage of secondaries. And then there's usually a second stage, and that's when the wealth is getting quite significant, where it's about taking a little bit of risk off the table and about you know, building a little bit of wealth outside of the business. That then kind of frees the mind up, we find, of founders to actually go to that next level ambition and keep pushing on and not be sort of afraid, I guess, that you know it could all go to nothing and also i think inspiring them to to not be constantly you know, worried about trying to find exits and you know doing stuff that's not just aligned with growing the company and and the ambition that you need to do that absolutely and kind of speaking about you know i guess kind of managing that risk as well i think everyone that listens to the show will very well kind of understand that running a startup is 
you know, a lot like a roller coaster. And I, I think in my conversation with Sibi, one of the things that he really mentioned in terms of kind of your superpower or one of the really big values that he gets from having you involved as a board member is how rational you're able to, to remain, especially in kind of really intense and emotional situations as well. How do you sort of... Uh, I guess, have a framework of kind of thinking through problems or kind of helping to diffuse those type of situations to understand, you know, the type of advice that you should give to founders, but also how they should then be able to sort of translate that out to, to their teams. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a, the perfect answer for you on this. I think, you know, maybe I'll, a couple of stories. Um, when I went into Blackbird, I'd, I'd started two software companies before, as we said, and I knew the roller coaster and the intense stress of it. And I know my wife knew the roller coaster and the intense stress of it as well. And here I was, you know, going to start a startup that was going to be involved in many startups. Uh, and I kind of promised to myself that I wasn't going to get involved. You know, I was going to stay a step above the sort of emotional roller coaster of all the different companies. So I've really tried hard to do that. I think. One of the things about learning, sort of changing from being a, 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 a founder to an investor is this sort of concept of changing from single focus to portfolio focus. And if you can do that and understand that we do at Blackbird have this quite diversified portfolio, such that if something does fall over or goes to zero, the rest of the portfolio should bring it through. Of course, we have some very big investments now that you know, if they were to, to fail, would, would have a huge effect on us. But in most cases, it actually doesn't sort of affect the outcome that we're searching for or our, our own ambition at Blackbird if one company fails. And we want to make sure that within reason that that is the case in most cases. And so I think there is an ability to, you know, you have to, as an investor, step above that day-to-day -day roller coaster. I have this sort of saying at Blackbird, which we've used quite a lot, which is around in moments of stress, it's our job to try and defuse the stress of the founder. And particularly, this is usually when things aren't going that well. And I think in the past, a lot of investors think that if things aren't going well, that's when you kind of pile onto the founder and you tell that that founder that they're not doing a great job and they've got to do better and that you know they're below target or this is going wrong or we're going to go out of business if you don't do this and that's to me is increasing the stress and actually doesn't help the whole situation it might make, help the, the the investor feel better because they're venting their own stress but actually what i try and do is is any you know high stressful or, or intense thing with founders is actually go in and, and actually sit down before I go into the meeting and think, how can I diffuse this stress? How can I, you know, firstly assure them that this isn't going to be the end of the world no matter what. And secondly, try and work through sort of just logical solutions rather than get caught up in the emotional. Yeah, it's it's actually been one of the the really interesting things that's come come up in the research for this interview. So everyone that I spoke to spoke about your ability to give uh, really constructive feedback. Uh, I think Fed mentioned that he said Rick never never tells us what to do, but he tells us what to focus on. Instead. <laughs> but yeah, it's you know, and and I think part of being a, being a founder or being a leader within a within a startup as well is obviously you have to kind of manage a lot of the, you know, you're constantly sort of putting out fires as well. Do you have any advice for for founders in terms of how they can sort of be the person that helps diffuse those situations? Do you have any sort of mechanisms that that they can use in their own business? I wish again, I wish I had a a, a great silver bullet for you here. I th I think it is firstly talking talking about it is is such a you know easy like it's easy for me to say but a lot of the value I think that I can add is just sitting down with founders and being a sounding board it's almost like asking the right questions so they have to think through in a logical way this stressful situation in in a perhaps less emotional way if I can ask a whole lot of questions which might be you know start with being sort of metric based you know so we get down to the numbers we remove the emotion, we start talking through what some of the root causes of those numbers might be. And so if it's, if it's sales are not going well, is it, is it, you know, firstly looking at the numbers and saying sort of why and where, and can we, can we try and pick out some of the reasons and secondly, let's go and look at the root cause. You know, is this a, is this a problem that's around market? Is it a problem that's around the, the product itself? Is it a problem that's around the pricing and the terms? 
or, or the people who are actually selling it? Is this a people problem? It's, I, I think if I can sit down and just ask them lots of questions, I'm not actually providing the answers. And often I have no idea what the answer actually is. But by giving them, a, I guess, a framework or a constructive space to themselves think, think through it and talk through it in a non-emotional, rational, you know, un, hopefully unstressful way, I think that's really useful. Uh, and I think it's sort of way underrated, you know. Again, so often I don't know the answer myself, but I, but I can just be a sounding board and a, and a way to help, you know, stimulate thinking. And in terms of stimulating thinking as well, it's, you know, again, from the outside looking in, it's been absolutely fascinating to see Blackbird's evolution over the last few years in terms of the the fund itself, but also, I guess, the ambition that, that you've had as a team. So I think as a team, you've grown from seven to about 40 people now for a VC fund. And obviously, even from a like fund focus perspective, it, it definitely, again, from the outside looking in, seems like there's been a shift in focus from more traditional software companies to focusing more on things like food and space and um, kind of really, really interesting tech. How, you know, again, how has that sort of, uh, I guess, come about and, and what have been kind of the discussions that you've had internally from Blackbird in, in kind of constantly sort of pushing or reassessing where that sort of focus goes into? Yeah, I'd, I'd start by saying our, our ambition has grown just as we see founders' ambitions growing uh, as you have success. Um, and Nikki often says, you know, it's it's a it's a founder's response to success that's really interesting, and whether they, in response to accept to to success, kind of hone in on that, amplify it, and up their ambition. And I guess we've tried to do that ourselves. So back in the beginning, you know, very small team uh, was you know Nikki and I thought of it as a sort of cottage industry. We I remember having a conversation saying, you know. We don't really want or need to build a team. Let's keep this small. Let's uh, let's see what we can do. And in the beginning, really, it was all about can we raise this first fund and then can we invest it in some good companies. And then we miraculously managed to do that, and uh, and we started to have some success. And you know, it came time for the second fund and managed to get some super funds to, I guess, trust us with some money, which is a wonderful thing. You know, as that's a big decision for them and a, and a big responsibility for us. And, I, and I, the ambition just started to step up, you know, in terms of moving from software to, to investing in, you know, far more crazy kind of cutting edge science based things. Uh, again, that kind of came naturally. We, we started with the first investment to really test us with Zooks, the driverless car team, at a time when you couldn't do this. The only people who were doing it was sort of Google in a very experimental way when it was illegal to drive, you know, to even have these cars on the road. Um, but we saw a founder with a wonderful vision and a really clear articulation of how he was going to get there. And that really tested us. And we, we decided to go, go for that investment. And I think that you start learning like anything. You start learning. We got confidence in doing software investments. We started with one or two, you know, quite small, more um, frontier technology investments. And then we made a few more and then we had success. And then we figured out, you know, I guess the pattern of, of, the way these companies go, you know, the ambition at the beginning, you know, it's always harder than, than you think. Often it's not just product, it's market and how do you break into a market, you know, and how often do you have to fund this and, and can you have the confidence to fund it halfway through when it's not quite there? That's something that really takes confidence building. And then recently, you know, I mean, recently in the last couple of years, Nikki and I realised that the future of Blackbird was really going to be the people that we could uh, employ and, and have join us and then help grow as investors and people who help founders and people who help us run Blackbird itself. That was going to be core to what we what we do. And I think we both at about the same time started getting this sort of this understanding that we got a lot of pleasure from seeing people come up within Blackbird and learn and then turn into these, these great investors themselves. And, you know, Sam and Nick joining us in the partner group was a, was a wonderful eye opener for us. And, you know, seeing them step up has just been wonderful. And then that started happening all through Blackbird. So we realized actually we wanted to build a team and we wanted it to be a great team and that Blackbird could be so much more if, if we had people to deliver on all the things that we really wanted to do. 
again, you know, one of the really interesting things that ca- came out of my conversation with Fed and Sibi was, I think you had mentioned, uh, it might've been in the first pitch or kind of in one of the early conversations that if they had asked for 10 times the amount of money, would they be able to move 10 times as faster? Which, uh, which I think is like, is a really interesting framework. And as Fed mentioned, you know, it's a really interesting way to uh, identify the bottlenecks for, for them as a, as a company as well. But uh, again, you know, just really curious to know from a fund perspective, are there things that you, you know, do or, or say or kind of question for yourself internally to help you kind of lift your own level of ambition or kind of think over the, the sort of next horizon? So we are, we are doing that right now. We're, we're trying to work out where Blackbird goes in the next five to 10 years. You know, I have to give heaps of credit to, to Nikki. He's a wonderful forward thinker and a, a wonderful, uh, I think, investment thinker and quite a contrarian thinker. You know, the old saying that to do well in investing, you've got to be right and contrarian, not just one or the other. And our challenge, I think, going forward is to, is where can we find places where that can play out? It played out beautifully for us in starting Blackbird because it was so contrarian, the idea of starting an, an Aussie VC fund. And I think the challenge now is to keep, keep moving in that space. So Nikki is excellent at doing that. We are... And now at the stage, we have six partners in the partnership group where we have to get a little more organized around how we brainstorm and how we form these this longer term thinking. Whereas before it was kind of Nikki and me, you know, famously having a laxa, you know, um, food court in North Sydney sitting on plastic chairs, kind of trying to brainstorm, you know, where what we might invest in or what Blackbird might look like. Now it, it becomes more... I guess we have to have a framework and a cadence for doing it and making sure we're doing it at a group level and communicating well and, and getting people's input and then and then driving results from it. So it's it's starting to change, but you know, I think that's a great thing. And you know, we're enjoying doing that now. Yeah, I it was again one of the things that Nikki mentioned to me was your your sort of famous Laksa lunches. And you mentioned how much more difficult obviously it is to do when you've got a, a much larger team as well. And again, for a lot of the founders that are probably listening to this are probably at that similar stage where they've kind of grown out of, you know, just being them and the co-founders to now having a team that yeah. they're sort of trying to translate that culture and and all of those sort of things that helped get them to that particular point, but are now trying to amplify that to, to additional team members as they're bringing them on board. What, what have been, I guess, some of the lessons or, or what are the things that you've sort of implemented at, at Blackbird that's helped you do that across the 40 people that you have now? Yeah. So I think the first thing is to actually sit down and think about it. People often just think culture just sort of grows and, and you know, you know, in, in an unformed, unstructured way. But I think the, the best sort of cultures have actually been thought about, written down in order to articulate them and then, and then measured. And I think, you know, I'm obviously, you know, conflicted in promoting Culture Amp, but we advise any team over about 15 really to start using Culture Amp or similar uh, or something similar to really measure how people are thinking, people inside the team are thinking. And it is really important to continually do that and then continually improve and then try and build times where you communicate that culture through to your team. Uh, we've just now moved and we, we had this sort of culture values statement, which is on our website. Everyone can read it. But we've now just implemented um, some what we call BOPS, Business Operating Principles, um, which is a much more, in, it's like an internal sort of way we act. So the principles that we, that we want to, I guess, uh, live by as we go about our daily lives at Blackbird and interact with other people. And that's a much more sort of granular thing. So we've been working on that. But again, it's about being much more, it's about being really thoughtful about your culture and actually sitting down and making time to do it and making it a priority because it's so easy to just let it slip by. You know, it's far more important to build a product. It's far more important to sell, sell to customers. It's far more important to service those customers and the culture thing just gets left behind. Yeah. I remember, um, I think it was Sunrise in New Zealand at the end of 2019, uh, where I think I first came across Blackbird's values or principles. And I think one of the principles was around doing things that our kids would be proud of or, or yeah. something, something along those lines. You know, again, from a, from a founder perspective, as you mentioned, everyone kind of talks about culture, but a lot of this is deliberate, but for, for founders, and I know certainly for me, it's been really difficult to 
uh, not just have the time to spend and think about what that looks like, but actually articulating what a lot of those sort of things look like. And I know Nick Crocker in the podcast interview we did, he was a really big fan of having sort of personal coaches and, and those sorts of things as well, uh, or founder coaches to, to help with some of that. But do you have any advice for, for founders who are potentially going through that stage and trying to articulate what their sort of values and cultures looks like, how they should or could go about it? You know, I, the way we did it is uh, Joel, who um, uh, was our head of community at the time, ran a structured workshop and we, we did an exercise where we, we all got little sticky notes and we stuck them on, on the TV screen about, you know, what we thought was important to Blackbird, what, what parts of Blackbird made us proud. Um, what parts of Blackbird we wanted to leave behind. And we kind of collectively came up with these, these ideas and brainstormed them together. You know, it was as simple as that, as, as really the group of us, it was a smaller partner group at the time, deciding what was important to us. It was as simple as that. Great advice. And, you know, obviously in terms of deciding what's what's important to you as well, I think it's been really interesting to see a lot of the the content that, that Blackbird's been pushing out as well. Particularly, I remember Sam wrote one about the rivers of inquiry that sort of led to investments in, in food tech. But, you know, again, like I just think it's such a great framework for, for founders themselves to think about, you know, what are different opportunities that are potentially not present straight away or not completely obvious for them to explore. Can you share what that's looked like from, from a Blackbird perspective in sort of exploring the, the rivers of inquiry? Yeah, so rivers of inquiry are, are wonderful things. One of the only free lunches, it's not even a free lunch, I guess ways you play the game better at, at venture capital is to put little bits of money in, prove out things that, that you think might happen and then put more and more money in. What, what this allows us to do is make a bet in something that might be really risky really early, which frankly, we know enough about to be dangerous, but then to go on the journey with that business. And obviously if it doesn't work out, we don't invest anymore. But if it does work out, we then get to, to I guess, get this courtside front row seat to seeing how the business and the industry works. And from that, we're able to use that expertise to, to make investments into things that are adjacent and have similar areas of expertise, similar networks. And so classic example is space. Where we started, we made our first space investment into a company called Fleet, which does small satellites to build a global uh, network for Internet of Things. Now, Nikki uh, first met this company and the thesis there was not so much that this was space and how awesome was it space. It was that this idea that a network for the internet of things was going to be something that was going to be really foundational to, to the world in the, in the long term. And it dawned on us that it would cost billions of dollars to just do that in say Sydney or Melbourne or, you know, alone. And yet for a few hundred million dollars, there was an opportunity to put a, a fleet of satellites and do it on a global basis from space. So it was less about that it was space and how exciting is space. And it was more about this fundamental kind of idea of building a network. But of course we had to get to know space. And so we put you know, a, a measured amount of money um, into fleet and we started networking and learning about space, which was awesome. Uh, and our, obviously when you do that, your you're an, antennae go up and you're searching for things. Obviously we, have this focus on Australia and New Zealand. And so it's particularly within those two markets that we are searching for things. And then, you know, we, we heard about Gilmore Space, who was Adam Gilmore had just started his team building this new type of hybrid rocket engine. And we were able to use the expertise that we've got from fleet to then test and get confident to invest in a rocket company. So there've been a number of different areas. You know, Sam has done a wonderful job of learning about alternative protein, both the plant-based alternative protein and lab grown meat. And again, we made our first investment. We've now made um, three investments in, the, in that space. Uh, again, learning about the different, uh, the different parts of the market and the different ways uh, you might invest. You know, Baraha came because we, because we'd invested in Zooks. So it's a, it's a, it's a great way to think about investing. 
And, and speaking about investing, you know, I, I think it would be kind of remiss for me to bring you on the show and not ask some kind of founder focused questions who, who want to get investment from, from Blackbird as well. <laughs> um, okay. So, you know, obviously we, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about at the start of this interview about how, you know, at the very start, all you're kind of looking for in, in founders is, is founders. And, um, you know, it's, it is very sort of hard to quantify, but I guess, are there particular themes or are there particular stages that it makes sense for founders to, to come to you to speak to as well? So I know from having conversations with a lot of early stage founders, a lot of the feedback that they get from VCs or what they hear is investors want to meet with founders early, but from a founder perspective, it's hard to know uh, when is it too early to meet with someone? So do you, do you have advice on, you know, ideally from, from your perspective, what's the right stage that a founder would be, that should be meeting with you to help kind of pique your interest and ensure that there's potentially a second meeting? Okay, I'm going to say it three times. Nothing is too early. Nothing is too early. Nothing is too early. I really want to get that across. You know, Blackbird's grown bigger. We're now investing out of a fund that's um, 650 mil in total. But the first investment we made out of that fund was 54K into a really, really early seed round. Um, we will invest super, super early. So there really is no time that is too early. Now, having said that, I think there, there are a couple of things. I think the, the time to come and start talking to us is when the ambition that you have has solidified itself enough that you can articulate that vision, usually the product that, that enables that, that, that mission and that, that ambition, you can articulate that well enough that you can convince other people to get excited and to think that that ambition just could become a reality and has a, a fairly decent chance of becoming a reality. That is a really good time to come and start talking to us. Now, obviously, at those super early idea, pre-product stages, the it's harder to convince us that we should fall in love and, you know, give you a whole load of money to, to go and set out on this journey. Of course, it's harder to, to convince us than if you've got a product in the market and, you know, a thousand users and they are all got these 20 metrics that are all up and to the right. But it's absolutely doable. And if you're at that stage where you feel really confident about that product and the way you can talk about that product, that's a great time to come and start talking to us. And so when you speak about getting other people excited, is that getting co-founders on board, team members on board? Like what, what, does, what does that look like from your perspective? Or are, are you not looking for anything outside of, I guess, Blackbird itself to get in? To a, get big, a big indicator of success, I think, is whether people can bring other people along the journey with them. So whether they can be this kind of magnet for great people who also get really excited about their vision and really want to jump on the journey. That's a great indicator that both the founder, the idea and the emerging space is a, is a really good space and a potential space to invest in. So absolutely, I think that social proof is quite important. You know, I often say I, I do the odd lecture at universities about startups and entrepreneurship. And I say that, you know, great companies are not built sitting in your bedroom, staring at a computer screen or having some genius idea. The best investments are usually people who are standing at the top of the mountain, screaming their idea out to anyone who will listen and that people are, are, are coming and joining them. They might run the local meetup on this particular topic. They might have built, a, you know, a side product either while they were at uni or while they were doing another job and had managed to get this little community happening. It's another reason why, you know, we, we don't like it when founders are all cagey about their idea and their product and, oh, you know, someone might copy it because the best founders are usually shouting their idea from the rooftop and they're confident enough that they are the ones that are going to be able to deliver on that idea. So, um, yeah, that, that social proof or that, that proof of being a magnetic force for great people I think is a, you know, is a really good indicator. And another, like, just, I guess, from based on conversations that I have with, with founders specifically about sort of Blackbird and getting investment from, from the fund is, you know, I guess a lot of question for founders is, is it better to go through Startmate to get 
funding for Blackbird or is it better to go directly to the fund itself? I guess from, from your perspective, you know, how should founders be thinking about that or, or how should they sort of approach that? Yeah, look, I, I, I think it actually doesn't make a huge amount of difference. StartMate is this wonderful program which can really help founders get go from this sort of idea to getting that idea in the hands of users and do that with a great sort of pre-built community that they get to uh, walk into. And that is a really, really great community to get advice from, to get, to, to get you know, introductions to other great people from, and also to be in this sort of cohort where everyone's doing it together. And it provides this sort of sense of belonging. And, and being a founder, let's face it, is, is, you know, is often quite a lonely activity. We've heard that said lots of times. And one of the great things Startmate does is provides you a really awesome community or even family around you as you go through that, you know, what is a tough journey. Um, so Startmate is a really, really awesome program. And I encourage, you know, anyone, you know, in the really early stages of, of their startup life to, to have a good look at it. Uh, and have a think about it and, and reach out to the Startmate community and learn about it. So Blackbird you know, looks closely at every single Startmate company. So we're absolutely on top of them. And I think historically about 20% of our investments have, have gone through the Startmate accelerator. So it's been a really good source of, of, uh, of deal flow for us and, uh, and will continue to be. And, so, and then, uh, you know, or you can come straight to Blackbird and, you know, we, we talk a lot about getting warm introductions. That's part of this sort of indicator of can a founder kind of find their way to us? Are they building this sort of magnetic kind of thing around themselves? It does make a big difference. But if for some reason someone can't get a warm introduction, we'll look at all the cold, all the cold emails that come in. And, you know, if something grabs our attention and we love it, we'll, uh, we'll jump all over it. Fantastic. And are there particular sort of themes, verticals that I guess Blackbird is I'm not going to say more interested, but like particularly sort of focused on with, with the latest fund as well? Yep. Uh, so look, a, a lot of the themes carry through our, our whole life. And then there are some, some newer themes that, that we're really interested in. So about 60% of what we do is software based. And then about 40% is the more the crazy stuff. On the software side, we obviously love SaaS. We've done a lot of SaaS investing and we, we know it well. I would say, you know, within the SaaS universe, we love things that have a bottom-up sales model, which is now tends to be called product-led growth. You know, all of our great successes have had that strong product, self-referencing organic kind of part to it. You know, we love things that are starting to mix machine learning into, into SaaS to kind of do things that you couldn't do before. I think more recently we've, we've, uh, we've made a few investments in, in cyber, um, in security. And, you know, we think that is something that is just going to continue being more and more of a, of a growth market. And we were, you know, really, I guess, excited to see that that, I think that there's a sort of growing up of expertise in that space in Australia and New Zealand, which is great. Um, we love things that are sort of tools to help engineers go faster. We love global marketplaces. So, so businesses that are bringing people together that otherwise couldn't interact in the way or can interact in a new way. Uh, I think that's really interesting. We love education and we love actually the, the coming together of education and, and recruitment. We think that there's going to be a continued disruption of the world workforce and a huge amount of retraining that uh, needs to happen over the next few decades. And we, we love sort of ideas that bring, bring together the, it seems to us to sort of connect and closely bind the, the job with the training and, and bring, bring people through that. And then on, on to the more science-based things. So autonomy continues to be a river of inquiry for us. So we, we had, you know, Zooks was a, was a big investment for us. It was bought by Amazon. Baraha, which we've spoken about, August Robotics is building autonomous industrial robots, which are very, very cool. We're really interested in the enablement of computers in healthcare applications. And that's started around diagnostics. So using machine learning, machine vision in, in medical diagnostics. 
we love the idea of helping doctors and health professionals be better and more consistent of taking out that human error part. And we've, we're just um, making an investment in that space, which we're really excited about. Quantum computing is really super interesting. We're looking at a whole bunch of things there and, and interested in, in both mainstream quantum and also the, the picks and shovels that come with that. Still interested in space. And then finally, climate. I think climate is something that we will be hopefully doing more and more of in the future. We have a couple of great investments in that space, um, which we're really excited about. And uh, we'll continue to search for it. There's a few things we're looking for. Fantastic. And just to close out the interview as well, I know that you mentioned that you're kind of in the planning stages right now in terms of what the next five to 10 years for, for Blackbird looks like. Is there anything that you're able to kind of like lift the lid on in terms of what it looks like from a Blackbird perspective or ideally, you know, what does the, what do you think the ecosystem will look like over the next five to 10 years? So I think our, our, our mission has always been how can we own companies through a long life cycle? And I think for us, it is it continuing to think about how we can own companies for even longer. You know, can we can we own Canva for thirty years, forty years, not just not just not just ten years? And then, if you're going to think about timeframes of thirty or forty years, you need to create the team, and you're not going to have the same people who are going to be investing and looking after those investments in forty years' time. And how can you create the team structure and culture that allows you to do that? I think those are the things that we're um, we're thinking through. How do you create a multi? It basically comes back to make creating a multi generational investment firm, and you know that's a really interesting challenge. That's uh, that's something that we're thinking about a lot. Uh, in terms of the ecosystem, look, it just continues to to snowball and gather momentum. It's just really just so awesome how much. Uh, it's grown over the last eight or nine years that we've been investing from Blackbird. And as I said, it's, it's the, the volume, we're getting just increased volume of those really great big ambition founders coming through the ecosystem. We're getting proof points. I think we'll get the, you know, the, the circle of life that you see in the tech, in the more developed tech ecosystems in Silicon Valley in particular, you know, is this wonderful sort of, people learning, doing, you know, being really successful and then coming back to the beginning either with their, with their money but in, with their expertise. And that's all just starting to happen now. We're still at the early stages of that cycle. And I think, you know, the next decade or so, we'll, we'll see it continue to grow. So super excited to be continuing to invest and I don't know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Absolutely. On that note, Rick, thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing your experience, insights, and, and journey so far. For any founders that are listening that are super ambitious and sit in one of the themes that you mentioned earlier, what's the best way for them to find out more, say hello, or get in touch? Well, start on our website, come along to one of our events, you know, come along to the Sunrise uh, Conference, which will be announced very soon. Get into the community and you'll you'll find, you know, we have lots of, lots of sort of ways to uh to get in touch with us uh so easy to do and uh you know finally if if, if none of those are working there's a there's a uh, form on the website that helps you get in contact with us directly perfect i will make sure all of those links are in the show notes rick once again thanks so much for coming on it's been absolutely thanks for having me it's been great bye Thanks for tuning in to episode 150 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. Before we go, I just wanted to say a big thank you to Rick, as well as all of the previous 149 guests that I've had on the show. And a big thank you to all of you for tuning in each week and supporting the show over the last few years. It really means a lot. I'll be back next week with another episode. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.